Hi there everyone, Daniel George here, and my research memo is going to be discussing a phenomenon that's coming up in the world of higher education that has been getting a lot of discussion in the last few years, known as the enrollment cliff, the college enrollment cliff of 2025. Uh, other people have called it the demographic cliff, but the idea is the same, that in 2025, we are expecting, based on data gathered over the last decade, that we could be seeing a pretty big drop-off in college enrollment numbers, and then that drop-off is going to potentially continue uh, for, 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 for the next decade, leading to, you know, understandably, a lot of changes in, you know, schools that may not survive at all and schools that are going to have a really hard time. So as forward thinkers, as a team that is trying to be futuristic and prepare for the challenges ahead, how do we prepare for that? So that's the topic of my discussion, looking back to see how we can look forward. Um, and so I am specifically speaking to President Dr. Charles Pollard and our uh, cabinet uh, of, uh, at JBU of uh, vice presidents. And so with the assumption that for some reason I have been uh, asked to represent our admissions team on the, 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 the cabinet meeting and present this to them. And so what is the enrollment cliff? That's kind of the first big question to ask. So really, um, uh, in 2008, the Great Recession, which uh, you know is when the housing market crashed, the economy was in really, really dire straits, and the big thing that started happening was that a lot of families started having less kids, and so that it, it was significant enough to where looking forward, we add 18 years to 2008, we get 2025, that that that, that kind of school year, and we are expecting a similar drop off in college age students around that time. You know, um, I. And, 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 and it, it, the math kind of, if we're just being objective with it, kind of makes sense. Less kids means 18 years later, less college students. And so in addition to that, we just live in a world now where uh, between, you know, getting to, you know, go to a trade school or even some, some jobs like, you know, you're able to even start a small business on, you know, social media or things like that. Just the need and the perceived importance of a college education is not as central as it used to be to American society. It's not the only way to make a living. And so we're having to contend with a lot of competition in that regard in the job market. And so we could be looking at some tough years ahead. And so what do we do? What do we do with that? And, and, and I think to make things more difficult, COVID, <laughs> you know, the pandemic over the last year and a half, makes a lot of these numbers that are gathered in these reports, you know, the, um, the, the, the WITCH report, which is, uh, you know, a big demographic report for higher education, they, they gather their information every four years. And so that information from four years ago is already kind of outdated because we've got a, a ton of, you know, drastically different circumstances right now that are making matters just a lot stranger. And so we want to look back and I want to look back to two time periods specifically, two situations specifically to ask how we can move forward. So first of all, let's look at the 70s and the 80s, which was a pretty significant dip in the world of higher education in terms of success, finances, and students. You know, the post-war period had been kind of the golden age and a lot of schools in kind of their tremendous growth weren't really expecting or prepared for a season where they would have to really, really work a lot harder to get students. Um, you know, around 1975, 1980, a lot of our sources tell us that the conversation was really similar. And some of you guys uh, on, on the cabinet who might have been in the world of higher ed around that time, you, you can attest to this. The fact that the conversation we're having about declining numbers and declining enrollment is not new. And so, you know, they were having a lot of the same conversations about, hey, we're not going to see this growth forever. In fact, here in the next few years, we're going to see it decline. And so what did they do? Before, we, before I get to that, I want to jump back even further to show that this issue is not new. This issue of what do we do, what do we focus on when we're pressed is not new. I would argue that a university's priorities are not measured the most by the times of plenty, by the times where we can just, yeah, we can add programs because we got students coming in every single day, you know? Those aren't the times that really test the university. It is the times of famine when we're asked to really appropriate our funds to the places that really matter the most to us. And so that's what really shows 
what a university is most prioritizing. And so let's turn to one of our, you know, uh, one of our most important texts in the world of higher education, the Yale Report of 1828. And so all the way back in the early 1800s, we have this, you know, one of our most historical colleges, universities in the U.S., asking this question of, could we get more students if we kind of changed up our education, if we went for more of these useful majors, if, if we followed the trend of some of these other colleges that were starting to go that way? Because, I mean, you guys know they were, they were a, a very classically minded institution teaching all the classical ancient languages. And of course, that conversation is a little bit different than ours today. But similarly, a lot of institutions I know have been having the conversation of, should we just cut some of our humanities-minded majors and specifically focus on, on you know, the STEM fields, on the more like useful majors that are going to get us a lot more students? Because yes, we do live in a world that sees the economy as one of the most important things, as you go to college to get a job, and that's what a lot of students are looking at. So if we just cut the less useful majors and focus on the more um, STEM-related fields, then we should get more students, right? The Yale Report, I think, is such a centering piece of literature in that regard because they, they, they really hold to, the faculty of Yale at that time really hold to, hey, that might be good for other institutions, and we're not telling them what to do. But for us, who we are, we are an institution that wants to create a well-furnished mind, a fully furnished mind within each student that we're educating. And so while these things might not be the most useful, the classical languages and stuff like that, we're not just teaching students what to think, we're teaching them how to think. That's who we are. And I think that theme of remembering who we are and having that vision guide us is actually the big thing that throughout the 1900s that the biggest universities really lost. You know, in, 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 in uh, John Thelen's book, you know, a, a History of American Higher Education, we see that actually, you know, in the 70s and 80s, one of the biggest challenges that uh, universities had, some of the most prestigious ones in America, was not just losing numbers, it was the fact that they had not invested in the core of who they were, their heart, their vision. They had lost the value of educating real students. And the public was starting to notice, hey, this is a place where there might be a lot of money and research projects and prestigious professors, but my, my, my child doesn't feel cared about or uh, doesn't feel like he's the priority or she's the priority here. And the American public was starting to get this idea of education that this was not a place that really valued students. And in that time, the Christian higher education institutions like JBU are the ones that really were able to carve out their own niche within the market in a time where student populations were declining. And so we, we actually saw, you know, our own kind of steady growth through hardship because we are an institution and we have been since day one that values, you guys know it because you're the ones who put it forth to us the admission staff, head, heart, and hand. We are a holistically educating institution, and we need to remember that, that we cannot just shift our priorities towards only educating students on, and, and, and giving them information towards entrepreneurship or engineering or just how to create things. We need to be fully furnishing their minds because that is the core of who we are. And that's, I think, I believe what makes JBU such a valuable school. And, and, and it is a valuable school in the sense that we, we are able to bring so many diverse ideas and people together in the body of Christ and in a community that supports them, prepare them for what's next, not just in their career, but in their calling and vocation too. And we need to remember that. And so my proposal for a way forward is let's steady ourselves because honestly, there's actually some research that's coming out right now over in the over the last year that seems to suggest that the enrollment cliff may not actually be as much of a cliff, a drop off, a huge decline, and more of a steady decline. And that's not something that we're super unaware of, you know, and that we're super unprepared for given our history. We've been through a lot as an institution, and we can continue going through trials because we are strong. Our heart is strong. God has made our institution strong, and we need to have faith in that. 
we can keep our humanities, we can keep our STEM fields and continue to do research on what fields are going to be more valuable to add to our majors, but let us not forget who we are, head, heart, and hand, Christ over all, and let that guide what we are doing here in the future. In the same way that the Yale report was a very centering piece of literature for the Yale faculty, let's not forget where our heart lies and let's let that lead us rather than the circumstances. Thank you. Have a great day.